What is public key cryptography and why is it so important? Okay. Uh, this goes back to Diffie and Hellman and sort of the history of cryptography. So cryptography, secret codes, have been around for thousands of years and they've been very important in world events because people often want to send messages where they fear an enemy will get their hands on the message. And so they encrypt it, they scramble it, and it's decrypted on the other end. And uh, this has been used for thousands of years and often failed miserably uh, during many periods of time and led to great disasters and failures of nations and of, of rulers and all sorts of things. It's been an important thing in the history of the world. And, uh, uh, but Diffie and Hellman in like six, 76, 77, were thinking about this. And, and like sort of like Ephraim Lipkin, they were thinking about the future of the world and what computers and networks were going to mean to the world. And they foresaw a day when all sorts of internet commerce and medical records and everything would be flying through the air at the speed of light all over the world and all this stuff was going to go on. Uh, and they said, that's going to create security problems, privacy problems, right? And one way to try to keep things private was cryptography. So they investigated cryptography. But they realized the internet was not like historical uses of cryptography. In the historical use, you had a general and his lieutenants, and they met at headquarters, and they shared a key. And then when they were dispersed in the field, that key was used as a key to encrypt and decrypt the secret messages that would be transmitted. Uh, but they said, you know, once this big thing, which we of course now call the internet, uh, happens, people are going to communicate with other people that they didn't know one minute before. They didn't share a key that, at headquarters because they're halfway around the world from one another and they never knew each other existed until just now, but they have to send important private information, you know, classically credit card information, for example. Um, and they said, we can't do it that old way where they share a key, because they don't. Can we do it without them sharing a key so that we can transmit this secret information and someone listening on the line won't be able to read it? Well, it seemed impossible to do such a thing. And in fact, at that time, the, theory, the mathematical foundation for cryptography had become information theory. And information theory, due to Shannon, uh, actually you could prove you can't do such a thing, right? But they said, well, there's this new stuff about called computational complexity, and there's this P and NP and all these things. Maybe we can exploit that and make a new foundation for cryptography where you won't share a key and you can still communicate in private. And, you know, very visionary stuff. And so they produced a, uh, a paper on it, and uh, that's how public key cryptography was born, and which is used invisibly to most users. Mm -hmm. All the time, anything's, you know, billions of times a day, I think. Ron Rivest got a copy of the paper. And uh, it could have been in, you know, it is before publication, I suspect, right? You know, manuscript. And Ron, Adi Shamir, and I were all young professors at MIT, and we were friends, and we used to do everything together. You know, we'd go on trips together, we'd have dinners together, we did everything together, and we were constantly collaborating on our common discipline, which was computational complexity theory. And, uh, and we saw each other every day. I remember walking into Ron's office, and he says, Len, did you see this new thing from, you know, these guys Diffie and Hellman at Stanford? It's all about this. You send this, and you scramble that, and then at the other end. Of and I said, and, and to my ears, you know, I'm trying to, you know, uh, save the dignity of science because Gauss told me to do it, right? 
And this isn't going to save the dignity of science, right? And so I hear this as, you know, some kind of engineering thing about networks and stuff like that. And I remember interrupting him, basically saying, well, that's nice, Ron, but, you know, let's talk about blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it meant nothing to me. And so Ron uh, did enlist Adi, who was interested in it, Adi Shamir. And uh, together they start working on this. But I'm always around these guys, right? And they become obsessed. Right? And they're constantly talking about it. And um, they're constantly coming up with possible public key crypto systems. See, Diffie and Hellman had said, this is how you could do it, but they couldn't make an actual incarnation. And, but they spelled out what you needed to make an incarnation. And Ravest and Shamir are trying to make an incarnation. And uh, they have numerous theories. And you know, some of them come from uh, graph theory and a variety of places. All sorts of things, combinatorics. They're going to create this public key crypto system. And uh, it's not, it turns out it's not such an easy thing to get it all to fit together right. So when they start to move into number theoretic kind of approaches to getting a public key crypto system, they're producing them every day. And I go in and I look at them and say, no, I can break that, right? You know, this, 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 boom, done. And mostly it goes that way, and it goes that way for months. And, uh, and occasionally they produce a really pretty clever system. And occasionally, uh, in one instance, they produced one so clever that I couldn't see how to break it, and I had to go home and really do some research to figure out how to break it, but it was breakable. Okay. And then uh, there's the night of Passover. I think it's 77, 1977. And one of our students, Ani Bruce, has a Seder or, you know, party and things for Passover. And she invites us all. The party breaks up around 11, say, and we all depart. You know, it was a nice evening. And uh, I go back to my house, run to his house, and I receive a call at like midnight or maybe 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock. And it's Ron, okay, and Ron says, hey, Len, what about blah, blah, blah? And the blah, 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 he said, is what we now know as the RSA crypto system. And upon hearing it, I said, congratulations, Ron. I think you finally did it, you know, because it looks solid to me. You know, this one, wow. I wouldn't know where to begin to break this, right? Well, I know where to begin, but I couldn't succeed. Uh, anyway, right? And I, so I said, congratulations, Ron. And so hang up. Ron, I think, does not remember this call. Okay. But at any rate, and I go into MIT, I think it's the very next day. And Ron has apparently stayed up all night and handwritten a paper. Uh, okay. And I go, you know, I run into Ron, he says, he hands me the paper. And I look at it briefly and I say, oh, it's, you know, what you called me about last night, you know, this public key crypto system thing. And the, the authors on that paper are the default order, mm -hmm. Adelman Ravesh Shamir. And in, you know, one of those quirks of fate, uh, you know, and this stuff happens in life, um, I say to him, take my name off that paper. And he says, why? I said, you know, you thought of the idea. And he, he says, no, no, we worked as a, you know, as a team. This is a team, you know, I'm not taking, you know, you deserve to be on this paper. So we proceed to have an argument about my getting off the paper and him, he's arguing to keep me on it. And so we agree that we'll just think about it for a while. And I go home. And I think, my first question was sort of moral, ethical. Do I deserve to be on this paper? You know, am I going to be comfortable with myself if I'm on this paper? And uh, I reflect on that evening or two that I spent trying to break one of those crypto systems that they came up with. And I said, well, that was real research. The rest was just casual observation. 
But that was real research. By the way, that, that system was discovered later by other researchers, published, but you know, it was born dead because it's already broken. Uh, and so I said, yeah, I guess I, you know, I'm comfortable that I did contribute something. And so, uh, and I also said to myself, well, no one's ever going to read this paper, you know, but it'll be another line on my resume when tenure time comes. So, okay. And I go back into Ron and I say, I'll tell you what, let's compromise. I'll become last author and you'll be first. And that's how it became RSA rather than ARS. And, uh, so that's the story of how RSA got born. Um, it still meant nothing to me, but it was soon to mean mm -hmm. a lot to me. Uh, one of the things it has is that it, it was first, you know, so it got adopted. Uh, the other thing it has is <clears throat> it's the cleanest of all the systems, I, I think. Uh, it, I always like purity. And I like to know what foundation I'm basing actions or theorems on. And even though it's not perfect, with RSA, it basically comes down to primality testing, which we know how to do fast, and factoring, which we don't know how to do fast. And it's pretty clear. You and I know that there's additional subtleties here. But but uh, it's pretty clear. So I can see the foundation clearly. I know what gamble we're making, basically, that factoring's not going to be done in polynomial time. Quantum computing aside. Uh, 